Hello, I'm Sue Nelson. I'm a science journalist and author and welcome to the Royal Society of Chemistry series discussing chemistry and climate change as we look forward to COP26, the United Nations Climate Change Conference in November. For nearly three decades, the United Nations has been bringing together people from almost every country on earth for global climate summits. As you'd expect from the Royal Society of Chemistry, they'll be showing that chemistry is vital for the understanding and tackling of climate change with a focus on batteries and energy storage. In this series, we'll showcase chemistry's contribution to electrifying the planet's energy transition to net zero and powering new discoveries and innovations. As we replace fossil fuels in power, transport and industry, new energy vectors are required to move and store energy. Hydrogen may hold increasing importance directly or via other energy carriers such as ammonia, but challenges remain in producing, converting and storing it affordably and conveniently. And this panel will discuss the latest chemistry which may open up a new hydrogen economy. Joining me to discuss this as an international panel of chemistry experts, I'm going to ask them to give a, a brief introduction of themselves and um, of their work within hydrogen. And we'll start with Fiona Landy from the Hydrogen Accelerator at the University of St. Andrews. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Fiona Landy. Um, I've been in the hydrogen sector around 11 years. Uh, started life at Aberdeen City Council, so led on the very early uh, bus project. And then um, I worked for the Scottish Cities Alliance uh, in the, and led on the strategy that kickstarted the hydrogen economy. I did that for around six and a half years and then latterly worked with Transport Scotland in their low carbon economy directorate, really concentrating on hydrogen around policy and how we can make that just transition um, to the decarbonisation, particularly around the public sector. I joined the Hydrogen Accelerator last year um, and I'm the delivery manager, so leading on all the projects that uh, we are bringing together at this moment. Thank you. Thank you, Fiona. We'll move now to Professor Edmund Sang from the University of Oxford, who's with me here at the Royal Society of Chemistry in London. Thank you, Sue. Um, I'm a catalyst chemist at the University of Oxford. Uh, the chemistry I'm doing is sort of uh, uh, studying the conversion of uh, chemicals from one form to another chemicals over catalysts. So we are looking to make uh, the reaction faster in general and the mild conditions at higher yield. And it's also, uh, you know, uh, with a longer uh, durability. Uh, concerning the hydrogen, um, we work on starting from we're making dirty hydrogen, you know, the steam reforming reaction we study. Uh, we also uh, study uh, water gas shift reactions. And then uh, recently we moved to, uh, to the green hydrogen, um, say uh, using sort of various catalytic means, including uh, thermocatalysis, electrocatalysis, and uh, photocatalysis to generate uh, the green hydrogen. So that's roughly um, the area I'm working on. Thank you. And uh, we'll move now to Dr. Sam French from Johnson Matthew. Good morning, everyone. So yes, um, Sam French, I work at Johnson Matthew. Uh, Johnson Matthew is a FTSE 100 company focused on sustainable technologies with about 15,000 people globally and just over 200 years old based here in the UK. Um, Johnson Matthew has a number of interests in hydrogen. In fact, we're looking at areas all across the hydrogen value chain. The three areas that we are really focusing in on are around production of hydrogen. So this is both uh, blue hydrogen and green hydrogen. I think we'll talk about the colors of hydrogen later, but we've also invested in a fuel cell business for about um, the last 20 years, looking at producing key components and a bit like Edmund, we're very focused on the chemistry and the catalysis, um, really the core elements of what makes these technologies happen. Thank you. Professor Francis Livens next from the University of Manchester. Good morning uh, and thank you. Yeah, Francis Livens from the University of Manchester. I'm, I'm the director of the university's Dalton Nuclear Institute. And 
and both as an institute and personally, I have an interest in how the whole nuclear fuel cycle operates. So that's the, the fuel, the reactors, and the, the back end, the management of waste and decommissioning. And um, one of the things that's become increasingly obvious is that nuclear may have a role to play in the future UK energy mix, a much more diverse and prominent role than perhaps it's played for the last few decades. So I'm very interested in understanding how we might integrate nuclear into to the bigger net zero energy picture. Uh, and in that context, I've recently been asked to, to chair a, a thing called NIRAB, Nuclear Innovation Research Advisory Board, which is uh, an advisory body for government on, um, in this case, principally new nuclear. Thank you. Last but not least, Professor Anthony Kusanak from Imperial College London. Thank you very much. Uh, my name, uh, as you mentioned, is Anthony Kusanak. I'm from Imperial College. I'm an electrochemist. Uh, and a professor of chemical physics. My research is all about uh, electrochemical systems based around energy and most specifically around hydrogen. I think uh, the electrochemical interface is a, is a really interesting one and, and, and as we move forward in the future, a really important one because it allows us to take renewable electricity and actually drive all sorts of chemical reactions. And we can do the reverse process. We can actually take those, those, those chemical species and actually use them to drive um, uh, you know, movement of electrical charge. So of course, at the moment, we have things like batteries, uh, the chloroalkali industry, the production of aluminium, those are all electrochemical processes. And what we're going to talk about today is very much about hydrogen. And one of the principal methods that you can produce hydrogen is through uh, water electrolysis. And then once you've got that hydrogen, you can then recombine it with, with oxygen to produce um, water and at the same time produce electrical energy. And that's where my research is all about. It's all about uh, what happens within those fuel cells and electrolyzers and how we can develop not only better catalysts, but also understand how those catalysts operate under the real operating conditions within, within fuel cells and electrolyzers. And just to give you one idea um, of the sorts of work that we've done, we've been you know, spending a lot of time developing new electrode structures that allow us to, to optimize the use of the catalysts uh, in, in, in fuel cells and electrolyzers. And compared to electrodes that were made several decades ago, we achieved the same sort of performance, but using 100,000 times less uh, catalyst within, within these structures. And that's all about placing the catalyst at the right position and making sure transport of all of the different components that are required for these reactions to occur happen uh, uh, efficiently. Thank you. Well, now we've had a brief introduction from all of our experts. Let's get Fiona to start with uh, setting the scene effectively and explain why hydrogen is considered a substitute for fossil fuels. Thank you very much. Um, if I just concentrate a bit on, on, on Scotland, uh, for instance, um, obviously we have an abundance of renewable energy here, uh, wind and water. And we see there is a, a, a very big role for hydrogen in that just transition from a very fossil fueled economy. I live up in the Northeast in Aberdeenshire. So we want to retain those jobs and that expertise that transition into, into a, a green economy. We see there's a, there is a massive role for hydrogen to play uh, within the hydrogen accelerator, we concentrate on green hydrogen. Obviously, there, there is blue as well. Um, but that's about us looking at where we can um, help to for wind developers, for instance, to make their business cases stack up, that they can actually see there is a role for the green hydrogen in terms of a fuel. Um, it definitely has a role. A lot of the heavy fleet, both off-road and on-road, we're involved in other projects such as trains and ferries and looking at other types of, of transport where hydrogen can really come into its own. It's a great energy storer as well when we have curtailed wind. So we can see that there is a, a very big role for hydrogen in this green economy as we move forward. And Sam, what are the different ways that we can produce hydrogen? I think it's important that we put hydrogen in the context that you know, we know we're gonna need a lot more electrification, but there are really uh, areas of the hard to abate, such as industry and heavy duty vehicles, where hydrogen has a key role to play. 
I mention that because when we think about some of those industrial processes, we need large volumes of hydrogen um, to really make them work, to, to decarbonize them. When we start talking about the different manufacturing routes, we have to then map supply onto demand. So that's why we think that it's really important that we have multiple ways of producing hydrogen. Uh, we talk, mentioned briefly that there are these colors of hydrogen. It's actually a rainbow of different routes to manufacturing hydrogen. And I would very much like, to be honest, for us to get away from talking about colors and more focus on, in on carbon intensity. So really of these different routes, the main ones that people are talking about at the moment are blue hydrogen um, for when we're talking low carbon, which uh, essentially is where you take natural gas and you use um, a, a process such as steam methane reforming, or ideally in this space or to thermal reforming because it allows higher capture rates. You produce high purity hydrogen and high purity CO2. The CO2 is then sent for transport and storage and sequestered. That can provide large volumes of low carbon hydrogen in the near term and is very suited for kickstarting our hydrogen infrastructure, but it does have some residual emissions. So we're also very focused on green hydrogen, and this primarily is a route where we're looking at using electrolysis, as Anthony's already mentioned, uh, and has Fiona, where we can use renewables um, to split, essentially to split water uh, in electrolyzers, and these can be alkaline electrolyzers, which is um, a technology that's been around now for uh, over, well, over 100 years in industrial applications, or more um, people are also very focused on PEM electrolyzers, so polymer electrolyte membrane electrolyzers, where uh, the view there is that you can have a smaller compact unit and these things are more capable of starting up and shutting down in line with the fluctuation in your renewable electricity. But I should mention that there are others. There are, I think there's a turquoise hydrogen, which is where we crack methane to form hydrogen and a solid carbon and something like pyrolysis. Uh, also, people talk about pink or sometimes yellow hydrogen. I think Francis mentioned earlier, this is a route where we're using nuclear uh, electricity heat to, to produce hydrogen. Again, this was with an electrolysis process that could well be using a solid oxide electrolyzer. So what we can see is there are multiple different routes to producing low carbon hydrogen, all of them differentiated from the current route today, which is primarily called gray hydrogen, where we take natural gas through to hydrogen, but we release all of the CO2. Fundamentally, the key though, is the carbon intensities of these different processes. You can make blue hydrogen and emit quite a lot of CO2, or you could have a very good process that emits very little CO2. Equally, we can have, if we were using grid electricity today in an electrolyzer, the carbon intensity of that hydrogen would be fairly high. So I think we need to move away from the colors and really focus on the carbon intensities of these different routes. Thank you. And thanks for giving a, a good explanation there of, of what those different colors actually re refer to. Um, Edmund, your experience is in uh, catalysts, uh, catalysis, I beg your pardon. Yep. And we'll come to the role uh, that may play in storing um, hydrogen. But for now, could you tell us how innovations in catalysts can improve the supply of hydrogen? It's being mentioned uh, by Sam and, and Anthony. Um, so in catalysis, we're looking at you know, material which is sort of a speed up the reactions in general. And we can find there are multiple way of uh, making uh, a product. Um, it's just like uh, we're traveling you know, from London to Oxford. There are many other ways. You know, some are more expensive, some are more difficult to, to do, and some are easy to do. So uh, we are uh, working on designing which is the best way uh, for the chemical conversion. Say, for example, in hydrogen, uh, we uh, talk about uh, the water electrolysis. You can find the right material 
which you can do the electrolysis using less renewable energy uh, compared with other form of uh, uh, catalyst. Um, also, we touch on some chemical form of hydrogen uh, like ammonia. You can make ammonia in a more easier way uh, with nitrogen and hydrogen at mild condition using less renewable energy. Um, that is very useful, very important. Or you can use uh, other route using nitrogen and water to make ammonia. So this is sort of how the catalysis sort of uh, be able to contribute in the hydrogen economy. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Francis, um, as a director of the Dalton Nuclear Institute, you touched um, on a, a little bit in your introduction there, but could you explain a little bit further about this connection between um, your institute and hydrogen? Sure. It really, I think, comes down to the quantity of hydrogen that you want. And a couple of people have, I think, indicated already the potential for hydrogen really to replace a large element of our current hydrocarbon usage. Uh, but if, if you do that, you, you find yourself very quickly needing millions, if not tens of millions of tons per year of hydrogen. Uh, and the primary energy that you need to create those quantities of material really becomes quite difficult. You, you find yourself fairly rapidly in a world where you're talking of you know, a couple of hundred thousand offshore wind turbines or vast areas of land under solar. So just the, the quantity of energy that you need to make lots of hydrogen becomes a challenge. Uh, and there's actually a really good report by the Lucid Catalyst, which goes into this in detail. So one of the things that nuclear offers is an awful lot of energy from a fairly small space. It's very, very energy dense. Uh, and traditionally, nuclear has been optimized to, to make electricity. Uh, and that's what we're very familiar with. It's a very established technology. And it, it gives us, even today, around about 20% of UK electricity. So the easy thing to do would just be to build a bunch of nuclear power stations and use their electricity to drive electrolytic hydrogen production. Uh, there are actually other things you can do with nuclear and there's increasing interest in running nuclear plants at higher temperatures uh, because that opens up both new options and greater efficiencies. So <clears throat> if, if, if instead of running at about 350 centigrade, which is where a, a current reactor runs, you, you run at say 650, that opens up um, high temperature electrolysis, which early indications are is potentially more efficient than low temperature electrolysis. So you're still using electrolysis, but you're getting much more hydrogen for, uh, for your megawatt hour. If you go higher in temperature again, actually, you can cut out the inefficiencies of turning nuclear energy into electricity into hydrogen and actually you can turn nuclear heat directly into hydrogen by driving thermochemical processes. But there you're up at you know, often eight, nine hundred, a thousand degrees. So they're very high temperature processes and they involve some very aggressive chemicals. So there's, a, there's an awful lot of chemistry involved in understanding the materials, in understanding the process, in building the plant. But uh, as I say, high temperature nuclear really opens up very different ways of making hydrogen in vast quantities. So I hope that's helpful. Uh, yes, it is. We've got a touch there on the, the chemistry behind um, the contribution then of, of nuclear power to uh, producing hydrogen. Um, Anthony, um, do you see nuclear power then as the, the answer to the supply of hydrogen on a, on a large scale? Well, I think I think nuclear power certainly has a, a place to to take in the uh, in the grand scheme of things of hydrogen production. Um, I do think that that um, utilizing renewable energy uh, is is something that we will see much more of in the future. 
Of course, for electrolytic processes, one of the big problems in the past with producing hydrogen in an electrolyzer has always been the cost of the electricity. Uh, so that means that, that hydrogen produced through electrolyzers has historically been quite expensive unless you site your electrolyzer, for instance, by a hydroelectric dam. And that's what happened in Norway starting even in 1929, where they cited uh, electrolyzers, water electrolyzers to produce hydrogen, which was then used to produce ammonia. I think we're actually moving into a situation now where because, because electricity is being produced through renewable methods, we're seeing a significant decrease in the cost of electricity. In fact, from a levelized viewpoint, the cost of electricity is falling to much less than, 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 than the cost of electricity made through other processes, such as, such as burning hydrocarbons, so that we can start thinking about uh, producing hydrogen even on uh, offshore in, in wind turbine farms offshore and then pumping the hydrogen um, you know, to the, to the land instead of exporting the electricity. And I think if you start doing those sorts of processes, you, you, you increase the efficiency of hydrogen production and also the distribution becomes a lot easier as well. And, and this is the case of, of, you know, this is the experience or what's, what's being trialed out in Scotland, you know, the idea of actually starting to, to integrate um, wind and, and well, especially wind, especially offshore wind with, with electrolysis um, in order to produce hydrogen and then distribute that hydrogen um, you know, you know, through the rest of the country. Uh, Sam, as you work in industry, it'd be interesting to get your take on what you think about nuclear's suitability for uh, this particular role in helping the supply of hydrogen. I think, uh, you know, I agree with Anthony's comments. Uh, fundamentally, well, and sorry, also Francis, is we're going to need a lot of hydrogen if we're going to make this transition and we're going to need large volumes of hydrogen. This isn't about a single technology being better than others. We're going to need all of them. They're going to play different roles um, in different locations. I would entirely agree with Anthony's comment for green hydrogen or hydrogen produced from electrolysis and renewables to happen, the key elements driving down cost. Uh, and the real ways of doing that are reducing the feedstock, the electricity price going in at the front end and scaling up the uh, manufacturing base to reduce the cost of the actual electrolyzers, working on the, the balance of plant as well as the key catalytic elements in there. And we can see a route to doing that. Um, so I think nuclear will have a role to play. Uh, I have to say that the UK, as an example, has set a five gigawatt target by 2030. On that kind of times, timeline, we would expect the majority of that hydrogen to be coming from <laughs> blue and green hydrogen products, which will allow us to get up to the required scale. As more plant comes online, nuclear plants, I certainly see there's an opportunity for that to be uh, an important part of um, how we grow the, the, the volumes of hydrogen that will be required to achieve net zero. Anthony, um, earlier in her introduction, Fiona touched on um, a number of roles that hydrogen is going to be playing in the future. You work on one particular application, which is fuel cells. Um, what advantages do fuel cells offer over burning hydrogen? Yes, uh, um, so, so you can think of a fuel cell as the reverse process of a water electrolyzer. So, so what you do is you take hydrogen, which is stored in the tank, and oxygen from the air, and you recombine them and you produce electricity. So, so a fuel cell is really just um, a, a bit like a battery, whereas compared to a battery, instead of having all of the material within the case of the battery, you actually flow reactants through, through the structure. And the benefit of fuel cells are, of course, if you want the fuel cell to operate longer, you just need a longer, you know, larger tank. Um, fuel cells have been developed for transport applications. In fact, um, Toyota, uh, you know, sell a uh, fuel cell powered car, and there are quite a number of them running through the UK at the moment. The, um, the Met in London has 11 of them. Of them. Uh, at Imperial College, we have one. 
Um, you know, the, the, the nice thing about them is that they, they refuel very similar in a very similar way to normal cars. So you just hook them up to a, a pressurized tank and within a few minutes, the car is actually um, refilled with hydrogen and you can actually drive off. The range is somewhat larger than, than typical battery vehicles. Um, but, but in general, uh, the difference between fuel cell vehicles and pure battery vehicles, and the important point to say is that a fuel cell vehicle is just an electric vehicle in which instead of a battery, you've got a fuel cell. Both of them are producing electricity. The real difference is, is typically going to be in terms of size. And the way, the way I like to explain it is to actually say it's very much like the difference we have between petrol and diesel today. You know, petrol, petrol powered vehicles tend to be somewhat smaller. Um, and, and go for, for shorter distances, shorter ranges, whereas the diesel vehicles tend to be you know, a little bit larger and go for much longer distances. And that's the sort of demarcation you might see between battery electric vehicles and fuel cell vehicles, where the battery vehicles um, are the things that are nowadays are petrol powered and the fuel cell vehicles are things that are now diesel powered. So, so for fuel cell vehicles, you might be looking for longer, you know, cars that go for longer distances, for trucks, uh, for trains, for um, shipping, you know, these are all areas in which in which fuel cells are being considered, and even for aviation, there, there's there's you know fuel cells being being looked at by a number of com uh, companies um, working in aviation for for passenger you know passenger planes that are powered by hydrogen fuel cells. So so that sort of gives you a demarcation between pure battery electric type vehicles and fuel cell vehicles, but of course fuel cells can also be used in other uh, situations as well. So for instance, if you have a hydrogen distribution network, and that's something which has been talked at, uh, about at the moment, where we, instead of pumping natural gas into houses, we pump hydrogen, then you have the possibility of putting a fuel cell in a house. And there, the fuel cell not only might produce electricity for the house, but of course, it also produces heat as well. So you, instead of having a hydrogen boiler that just, just produces hot water, you have a hydrogen, a hydrogen system that not only produces electricity for your house, but also hot water at the same time. And these sorts of systems already exist in Japan, for instance, where 300,000 houses already have these combined, what are called combined heat and power systems based around fuel cells. Um, in those cases, those, those systems are somewhat more complicated because they use natural gas. But in future, you know, we could actually have some uh, systems that use hydrogen that would actually be um, simpler and, and less expensive. And, and, you know, we could actually run our houses from electricity, um, you know, made in the fuel cells on the side of our house. So that sort of gives you, a, you know, an idea of the different sorts of areas that you can actually put um, fuel cells in. Fuel cells produce electricity um, by the conversion of hydrogen and air into water. Um, and what research is currently being doing then? You mentioned in, in the future, uh, what research is being done to actually improve this technology so we actually get to a place where fuel cells in, in those ways and examples that you've given will become a, an everyday reality. Sure. Well, I mean, I would say they are an everyday reality, you know, for the 300,000 people in Japan who have these fuel cells in their houses, you know, you know they're actually operating and for the you know, Toyota is producing tens of thousands, you know, 10,000 of these cars a year, you know, and, and they're in the sort of, you know, ramping up the production. So there are many, many of these sorts of systems already available. Um, in the future, what we need to improve the, um, the systems is to improve the efficiency, improve the, the, the manufacturing. Um, you know, we're, in the, we're probably in the state where um, if you were lithium batteries was maybe 15, 15 years or, or so ago, where, where the, the, the rate of manufacturing was somewhat lower. Um, you know, the, the delivery of fuel cells is increasing at, by, by 40% a year at the moment. So we're going through this exponential phase of, of delivery of fuel cells. Um, and, and, you know, it's all about reducing cost, improving performance, improving efficiency. And we'll return to you, Edmund, now, because a lot of the sort of advantages and the attraction of hydrogen is that uh, its ability to store low carbon energy so we can then match seasonal demands and to produce more energy dense fuels for aircraft and, and ships. What are the advantages then of hydrogen based storage over battery systems? Um, 
what we see is actually now is widely available um, of the uh, renewable or renewable electricity. That is good. But we, one thing we need to consider is, you know, some area might be very rich in uh, renewable than the other. So we started to think about, uh, you know, how we transport or store those renewable energy. And we uh, always, it would be better to have a kind of uh, storage and transport to mitigate, you know, the uh, seasonal difference. You know, uh, sometimes we, like in the uh, summer, we have a more renewable available, you know, the wind and the, uh, the solar in particular. And uh, in the winter, we have less, but the demand can be opposite. Even, you know, when we look at, um, you know, different time of the day, and, you know, in the solar means, um, we have the light while you have the renewable, but in the dark, you don't. So these sort of intermittent sort of supply of the uh, renewable makes you think about, you know, you need to store it in a more, uh, you know, sort of a uh, economic way and uh, be able to transfer or ship it to other places. Um, so we see it, you know, the hydrogen storage is important uh, in this respect. And in particular, other form of uh, chemical hydrogen. Uh, we mentioned about ammonia. So, uh, and the ammonia, we see a lot of advantage. For example, the ammonia, you can, uh, in the same volume, you can have a higher uh, energy content, higher amount of hydrogen than the liquid hydrogen. Or, you know, if you consider uh, pressurized uh, hydrogen, 700 bar of hydrogen. So the ammonia will have, say, about three or four times more hydrogen. And, uh, and if you compare with the lithium ion battery, uh, we call it the uh, energy density. And the ammonia have more than uh, so seven, eight times energy density than the lithium ion battery. So in this uh, respect, you know, and they, we see a lot of advantage of turning the, uh, you know, renewable to a form of hydrogen and in particular ammonia. So we can ship it. Uh, we, we have already uh, have a vast, you know, network of shipping energy, um, you know, I mean, shipping ammonia. And uh, we, uh, we ship it energy from one location to the other. So if we turn the renewable energy to ammonia, we can ship to the, uh, to the place we need in a cheaper way. And what type of work is going on then in, in this area and, and where? Oh, um, there are lots of things happening, uh, in particular sort of, uh, in the community. We see ammonia is, is sort of a, a very important uh, you know, chemical form of hydrogen for transport and storage. For example, air product identify uh, ammonia is uh, sort of the key uh, chemicals, you know, for the long uh, transport and um, and the storage. And in particular, the the long distance, you don't have uh, you know the grid, the energy loss uh, through the the grid will be quite substantial uh, in some cases. And using the sort of a chemical form of uh, hydrogen as in form of ammonia, you get less loss during the, uh, the transportation. And uh, I mean, there are many announcements recently. Uh, for example, uh, the Norwegian uh, company, uh, you know, who make fertilizer, uh, Lara, and they are doing so for now, uh, joining with the hydro, um, hydro energy company to create another uh, big company and they're turning their ammonia to green ammonia. So that is moving the ammonia rather than doing it as a fertilizer. They are doing it as for the energy, uh, renewable energy transportation. So there are many other announcements um, in the last year or two. 
so it's pretty exciting. That sounds area. it. That sounds it. I'd like to move on now to discuss the hurdles that remain in scaling up our use of low carbon hydrogen. Uh, Fiona, you're with the uh, with Scotland's Hydrogen Accelerator, which is this partnership between the universities of St Andrews and Strathclyde, and it's assisting companies through the hydrogen supply chain. So it'd be really useful to know how you're actually doing this work between academia and industry in supporting this aim. Yeah, so the Hydrogen Accelerator was set up and a commitment from the Scottish government, and it is to do, as it says, uh, it is to accelerate the uptake of hydrogen technology in, in Scotland um, and to build up the expertise and, and supply chain as well. So our role is very much working with public and private sector organisations to learn from the projects of the past where we've done quite novel projects and we've learned an awful lot. But now it's really scaling that an opportunity up. So looking at joint procurement, we look at the public sector, for instance, where we're bringing a number of those local authorities together when we know we identify commonality across different few, um, um, transport applications that they can then do joint procurement. So it's always trying to get that economies of scale, large scale production of hydrogen. We don't see localised electrolysis pickled all over Scotland. We'll have strategic sites in various um, locations across Scotland. And then the offtake, as Anthony's mentioned, and Sam, it's all about getting that distribution right across. Um, so our role is very much supporting SMEs, trying to bring their projects and the products to market. So whether we can help and uh, try and build up that hydrogen economy, um, that's the role for St. Andrews University, and obviously with Strathclyde on the engineering side too. So it is all about that, because um, our challenging uh, program we have in Scotland you know, it's zero emission by 2045 is pretty challenging. So I do think that there's a lot of help that's required, particularly the public sector, to make that just transition to a green economy. And you mentioned, you know, you've been learning from the process as well. What sort yeah. of things have you learned through this collaboration? Sure. And um, if you look at some of the, the projects of the past, it's, it's really important that we have localised supply chain opportunities, that when we, when we start to move away from a fossil fuel economy, that that just transition, we don't start losing jobs for oil and gas, we bring that expertise with us. An example of that is our zero emission train project um, through our supply chain engagement. We've got five companies and a lot of those are oil service companies that are actually working with us on that train project. We want to build up and retain that knowledge and expertise, not only in Scotland, but the rest of the UK, um, and also have those high value jobs distributed across Scotland in a rural environment and in a city environment. So that's where we really want to start to see that, that transition taking place. And so wherever we can identify and help with that um, piece of initiative, then that's, that's what we want to do and we are doing. Um, with the fuel cell electric buses, um, with refuse collection vehicles, for instance, big polluters, um, we have worked with our Arcola Energy and with uh, Farad Hill End, again, building up that expertise and supply chain opportunities in Scotland. And now we're going to start ramping up that um, deployment of those, those particular vehicles right across the public sector. So yeah, it is really about that supply chain and retain the expertise in the UK and in Scotland. And what would you say has been the, the biggest challenge so far? Uh, the price of hydrogen, which has dropped dramatically over the years, um, it is trying to hit the right scale. Um, as Sam mentioned, it's the price you're paying for that energy. It is learning about uh, joint procurement, it is um, trying to get a consortia together. Collaboration is really, really key in the hydrogen sector if we're going to really try and hit some of these targets. So we've learned a lot of lessons around not having a local supply chain where you have vehicles off the road, but they're not, it's not because of the hydrogen technology, it's because you don't have a window for your bus or a door. It's learning about, you really do need to make sure you've got a dis distribution fair and wide across both the, the transport applications and also that hydrogen refueling infrastructure which we're starting to actually map out and deploy across Scotland. For Glasgow, for instance, um, you will see there's very large scale production of hydrogen with Scottish Power, ITM Power and BOC, starting with 20 megawatt, that we can start having that localised production at, at Whiteley, the big wind farm that's owned by Scottish Power. And then we start to distribute across the west side of the country. And we like to do that again on the east side and then concentrate on the central belt and the highlands as well. Um, and then obviously looking at the different transport applications, so off-road, on-road applications, ferries, trains, for instance, we have really 
large scale demand. Uh, forestry is another, it's another um, <clears throat> excuse me, particular sector. And all those other hard to decarbonize sectors that Sam mentioned around industry, your steel, your cement, where hydrogen can really start to come to play. And as a consortia, can join with public private sector organizations that can have that off uh, take for large scale production of hydrogen. And Sam, where do you see the potential for your business? So um, I think where we're at is really trying to, as mentioned, kickstart this and grow scale. Um, one of the elements there is we need to be driving down cost, as has been mentioned by multiple um, contributors. Now, in that policy is clearly critical as well. And we can't get away from the fact that currently the cost of hydrogen will be higher than that for unabated fossil fuels. So we've been working very hard with government as part of industrial bodies to support, because what we really need is private sector investment to come in. But to do that, we know that they're going to be seeking a return on their investment. So the work that's currently ongoing with the Department of Business, Energy, and Industrial Strategy uh, around policy is on a couple of elements. One is around the business models. And there they're looking for something similar to um, what kick-started offshore wind here in the UK. And as Anthony's already mentioned, has really seen a dramatic drip, um, cost down over, over the last decade or so. So that's something like a contract for difference model. Um, <clears throat> we also need to really be clear on the standards for these things. If, these, if this is going to make net zero contribution, then we need to be um, really imposing a high bar. Hydrogen we produce has to be low carbon uh, with the minimum carbon emissions associated with it. So we really need that to, those two elements to come in. Then from the private sector, we need to be deploying. We need these first projects on the ground. It is a value chain. And in some senses, that's a little bit the complexity for hydrogen, um, offshore wind, and to some extent, battery electric vehicles have had it relatively easy because there's an infrastructure in place you can plug into both um, to provide you know, somewhere for your electrons to go from offshore wind and also somewhere to get your electrons from, from a battery electric vehicle. I would say, though, that both of those infrastructures are going to need a lot of investment as we start to, to deploy further. Hydrogen slightly the other way around. You need an, an initial investment to put the infrastructure in place, whether that's refueling stations or pipelines to provide the hydrogen to industry, for example, as well as uh, learning how to fuel switch away from their current fossil fuels like natural gas to using hydrogen. But then when you've got that infrastructure in place, it will be more cost effective in the long term. Um, so we're focused on providing key technologies into uh, in, in to our partners that we're working with, but the real element that we need to do through this decade is start deploying projects at large scale. And by large scale, this has to be hundreds of megawatts, if not gigawatts, which will give us the learning. We need to deploy to learn, and then we can have a strategy and a roadmap for much wider deployment through the 2030s. And then through that period, we will start to see things like hydrogen from nuclear coming on, large scale use of uh, ammonia, to begin with, we think these the deployments are likely to be in clusters around industrial um, emissions zones at the moment. Um, and then over time, that will broaden out to be a more countrywide and a more global um, hydrogen supply. And I agree with Edmund, then we'll be seeing production potentially in areas with low cost renewables. So that could be could be Scotland, could be Chile, it could be North Africa. Conversion into something that makes it easy to carry ammonia, methanol, and then transportation to areas where they can't access those low cost renewables. We're thinking here about places like Central Europe and Germany. It, it sounds as though there are also going to be an awful lot of uh, jobs produced in, in relation 
uh, to this. And um, Francis, from, from your point of view, where do you see those um, jobs coming? Which areas? I, I, I think um, for me, I, th I, th I think what it's about is that the UK should position itself to be a nation that does hydrogen and not a nation where hydrogen is done. So, I mean, if you look at the parallels in nuclear, we built, designed and built and operated fleets of our own reactors. And we lost that ability since Sizewell B in, in the mid nineties. And we're now in a position where all we can be is a customer for somebody else's technology. So a lot of the high value jobs and the economic opportunities associated with those plants are overseas. And I think hydrogen is, I think, an area where if the UK committed, it, it, could, it could have early mover advantage, it could grow its own hydrogen industry, it could be a supplier rather than a customer. So, so for me, that's what's really important, that we, we commit to this uh, in the sort of way that Sam was talking about, so we get in early and we make it work. Fiona, do you agree? Absolutely. And that's what we've been doing in Scotland. Um, very much so is about deployments, get that innovation on the ground and then start to scale up. Um, we, we, we need to move quicker than we have. Um, it's quite frustrating to see you know, how slow it is to actually get the things actually going in terms of the transportation side, for instance. Um, but that, that we do really need to be doing that right across. Yeah. And retaining those high value jobs, let's say with the oil and gas industry, for instance, they can transition quite happily into a green economy, um, retaining those, 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 those expertise and skills as well, really important, yeah. And it would be interesting to know what you all think is going to be, the, we're going to see first as hydrogen production and use is scaled up. Um, Edmund, what, what do you think we'll, we'll see first? I, I just sort of um, feel, you know, the most important is, you know, uh, at uh, the course, you know, um, and it's the government position, you know, if we have some incentive, um, so let's say the carbon credit or things, you know, that will change, um, you know, um, uh, at the moment, you know, I think it's the, um, the hydrogen made from renewable is still uh, expensive, more expensive than uh, from the uh, fossil fuels. So, um, but if we start to have more people, to, you know, to, uh, to work on it, you know, in a larger scale, then, uh, you know, it, the, the cost of the renewable hydrogen will be lower. And the, I think the government position is also very important. You know, if uh, there's a carbon credit or, or trading, then it really will change, you know, the, uh, the scenario. Anthony, do you have anything to add to that? Well, I suppose, you know, thinking about, thinking about it from the electrolysis side, one of the issues, um, well, it's not an issue, but one of the things you have with electrolysis is you only really produce one material of, of any use, and that's the hydrogen. Um, when you electrolyze water, you also produce oxygen, but actually that oxygen is, is only, only has a very small fraction of the value compared to the hydrogen that's produced. And I think moving forward, so what we want to start thinking about is, is not necessarily producing oxygen as that secondary reactant, but producing something else. And a really good example of, of what can be done is something like the chloralkali industry. In the chloralkali industry, you produce hydrogen and you produce chlorine and you produce sodium hydroxide. Um, and, and your starting material is just salt. And it actually turns out that the, the sodium hydroxide and the chlorine is worth about 20 times more than the hydrogen that's produced. And in fact, in the chloralkali industry, about 15% of the hydrogen that's produced is just flared off. It's not even used. So this is an example where through an electrolytic process, actually your secondary, you know, you know what's, what's being produced on your other side is actually worth much more than the hydrogen. And I think rather than producing hydrogen and oxygen in an electrolyzer, we should think about, you know, in terms of science and chemistry, 
we should think about other electrolytic processes we can be we can be performing so we actually produce two valuable chemicals at the same time we produce hydrogen plus something else and there's a whole range of other things that we might be able to produce that will allow us to decarbonize the rest of the chemical industry through those those valuable oxidants that you might be able to to produce at the same time with the hydrogen. And that would be another way of significantly decreasing the cost of the hydrogen that you actually produce because you're actually producing two valuable chemicals rather than just one that you do at the moment when you electrolyze water. But this is, this is an area that requires a lot more research and, and much more understanding. In fact, there was a lot of work done in the 30s, the 1930s, in these sorts of you know, studies but, um, but because of the use of petrochemicals and the use of, of, of um, you know, you know the, the growth of petrochemicals, other chemical processes were, were you know, which use those petrochemicals were actually developed. So I think may, maybe taking a leaf out of the book, going all the way back to the 1930s and, and that, that period, you know, we actually might be able to decarbonize much more of the chemical industry, not just from the hydrogen, but from the other, other species that we could be producing at the same time. We heard from um, Francis when he was saying that effectively the UK needs to sort of take a, a leadership role uh, in, in this particular area and, and production and use of, of hydrogen. Does the UK have um, a, an advantage in any way or, or should we be cooperating with a specific country or, or, or technology or, or company? You know, what do we need to to make the most of, of what we've got and whoever would like to jump in on that please just do so maybe i can i can start if, if that's yeah. okay you know, you know I, th I think from an electrochemical viewpoint in terms in terms of fuel cells and electrolyzing those areas um the uk actually has a you know is historically very very strong in this area you know from 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 electrochemical systems and actually understanding how to operate electrolyzers and fuel cells we have you know johnson matthew is sort of one of the, the world's premier producers of fuel cell catalysts and and and, and catalysts for electrolyzers as well now um, but we've also got a very rich history of development of electrochemical systems so i think you know that that um you know the whole area of electrolysis and hydrogen production really you know through through renewable energy usage really plays to our strengths yeah, I think it's, um, say, for example, offshore wind. I mean, we, we have the offshore wind. And uh, it sort of, um, again, uh, we talk about supply chain. So the, at the moment, it's not complete. So, um, and the cause of this is sort of using offshore wind is sort of, uh, to produce hydrogen is relatively expensive right at the moment. But you can see it if we can complete the supply chain and making things are more easier in a bigger scale. I think the, you don't need a, uh, you know, immediate technology breakthrough. It's just completing the chain. Then you can see things will be changing and the renewable energy will be cheaper and cheaper. Then uh, I think the things will be making more sense. And UK is pretty good in this area. Yeah, I agree with the comments. I think, um... There are cases where we've let go of some of the high value items, a little bit like offshore wind. We've deployed a lot, but we don't have the, the manufacturing base really producing the high value uh, components. With hydrogen, we do have some real advantages in that we have access to low cost renewables. Uh, we've talked a lot about deployment of offshore wind in places like Scotland. We have a very good natural gas infrastructure to transport, which can be converted to hydrogen. And we also have some uh, leading companies and technologies, as well as the <clears throat> underlying service industries that will be able to deliver these projects. I don't think we'll be able to do everything from the UK and we will need partnerships and I think that's important, but we should really be focusing on making sure we bring the high value items in and the faster we deploy in the UK, the quicker we can build that supply chain to the point that we'll be able to export it to other countries. And, and how can governments support all of this, whether it's development of a new hydrogen supply or all the, the, the supply chains and, and the technologies? Is, is there more that government can do? 
I think there's always more the government can do, but to be honest, they have been very positive. We saw the hydrogen strategy launched in the summer in the UK. Um, they have a number of work groups. I was chairing one, which was around the 2020 deployment roadmap, where they're clear on what they want to do to achieve their five gigawatt target by 2030. Now we could say that if we were to be ambitious, we should be looking for for more than five gigawatts. But anyway, we've got a target and now we're going to build real projects on the ground at scale that will be the proof points that will reduce the risk, reduce the, the cost and allow us to see how hydrogen can be utilized. And if we can do that and get to that position, we will have be the potential to have scaled up our supply chain quicker than others. So it's really about these next steps about deploying. And as we deploy, we will learn more. We will invest more in R&D. We'll see that private sector investment come in that will then drive down the cost in the future and allow us to get to larger scale. And finally, with COP coming up in November, uh, I would like to just hear from each of you what you'd like to see coming out of the negotiations. <laughs> Fiona, let's start with you. I think um, you know, Glasgow hosting COP26 this year, it'd be really great to see you know, world leaders coming together that they take energy um, and the decarbonisation um, of our, our world um, very, very seriously. And we start to really scale up and ramp up the opportunities to do that because I, I, it's challenging enough as it is. But I think we're all too slow in that uptake. And if there's ways we can collaborate across international um, countries, then fantastic. Let's do that. I think from the government, the UK government, Scottish government, I'd like to see more funding coming in for the R&D side. Um, but obviously we need those invest investable opportunities. So bringing in investors internationally as well would be fantastic to really help us in decarbonisation. Francis? A clear sense of direction, I think. Commitment, um, a clear sense of uh, instruction to go for it, deliver something. And I think that would bring us many of the things that Fiona has just been asking for as well. Anthony. Yes, I'd like to reiterate, you know, the comments, you know, of the two, two previous people. I think, I think, you know, those are those are really important. I think the other important thing we need to think about is that we're going to need new skills moving into the future. And the government really needs to think about, you know, shifting the uh, centre of gravity in terms of, of, of skills and, and where our energy is going to come from. Maybe, maybe they need to sort of rethink about the way that, that, that different energy type systems are taxed in order to incentivize ones with, with much lower um, CO2 emissions. And I think that's something which could do a lot to actually help the fledgling industries that are just starting at the moment. So more, more people studying chemistry uh, as well than I assume. Um, yeah. Yeah, I see the, um, the government uh, in different countries can play a, a very significant role in uh, helping the uh, decarbonization. Um, say, uh, for example, it's been mentioned about encouraging uh, the small companies, you know, they might have a very good idea to do things, but they, they, they might not have the money or infrastructure to do it. So the government uh, can help to um, you know, sort of create some kind of demonstration project, putting more R&D money in there. And they sort of internationally, we can set some standards, you know, about uh, the preparing for the infrastructures, um, you know, for renewable uh, transport. There are many things we can do. And I know it gets harder, the more people speak than to actually come up with uh, uh, an answer. So uh, I know I've given you Sam as the, the last person to give an answer on this, probably the, the hardest job, but is there anything uh, that hasn't been said so far in terms of what you'd like to see coming out of the COP negotiations? I think that there are two elements. There's the coming out, the global um, decisions to move away from fossil fuels, Carbon taxes, carbon border taxes and standards, as Edmund mentioned, are key. A lot of what we're talking about are, are commodity markets, steel, for example, ammonia, chemicals that are traded globally. How do you move to a low carbon, higher cost 
material in one country where you can import something at a lower cost, but with higher embedded carbon emissions, that's really tricky. So historically, those global agreements are the most difficult. From a national perspective, I would really like us to be announcing the first clusters that are going to drive the deployment of hydrogen in the UK. I think that could be a, a flagship announcement. And also something around being more joined up in the hydrogen space at the moment. Um, it, there's a lot of focus on industrial energy, which, as we've all mentioned, is a hard to abate sector, so it really suits hydrogen. But at the moment, we don't have a joined up approach, for example, for heating. What are we going to do in the UK around domestic heating? And transport has historically been very battery electric vehicles focused and slightly ignored the role of hydrogen, particularly in things like heavy duty vehicles. So a more comprehensive view of how hydrogen will support the UK transition to, to net zero. Well, that concludes our Royal Society of Chemistry discussion on the chemistry of hydrogen production and use. My thanks to all our panellists today, Fiona Landy from the University of St Andrews Hydrogen Accelerator, Professor Edmund Sang from the University of Oxford, who came into the Royal Society of Chemistry today, Dr Sam French from Johnson Mathey, Professor Francis Livens from the University of Manchester, and finally, Professor Anthony Kusanak from Imperial College London. And thank you for watching. You, you can find more Royal Society of Chemistry discussions around the UN's COP26 programme on the Society website at rsc.li slash COP and the numbers 26 or on their social media channels. So I'll hope you'll join me, Sue Nelson, and a host of expert guests for more episodes in this series, as we explore chemistry's vital contribution to electrifying the planet's energy transition to net zero and powering new discoveries and innovations. The chemical sciences are at the heart of sustainability solutions. Sustainability powered by chemistry.